Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash using your power. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Based on today's podcast, I'd like to recommend Liberation Upon Hearing in the Between, Living with the Tibetan Book of the Dead by Robert Thurman. <laughs> Welcome to Using Your Power. I am David Andrew Weeb, and joining me is... Mavine Cora. How's it going, Mav? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm powered up, man. Yeah? Yeah. Love it. Why are you powered up this week? You know, I'm focusing a lot more on simplicity these days and getting my business and my life and my work life and everything down to simpler, manageable concepts. But that's a lot of thinking, actually. <laughs> yeah, I think it involves more thinking to think about how to make it simpler rather than more complex. You know, For example, what services do I actually need? Which services do I no longer need? Which ones am I paying money to month after month that I could actually be saving and using towards more effective or more valuable things? So all those kinds of things I'm beginning to think about more and more these days. Right. And just like anything, right? It does take time to develop a system and once you get that system in place i think we were talking about this right before we started recording here but uh you you start tweaking that system you know a little bit by little bit maybe every two weeks or maybe every month or or whenever right as maybe new tools come out you're always going to be retweaking just to make sure your systems are always staying in place so it does take time and it's never really ever finished is it it's not you don't really get it perfect and if you happen to be using one product to help you with that process and then all of a sudden you decide later on oh no i like this service or this tool or this app better than this tool so i'm going to replace it now your process looks completely different because maybe it was tap the button in the right side upper right side of the screen before suddenly it turns to tap the button in the lower left side of the screen so now your process is different even though it's you're going through the the end result i guess is the same but the the exact steps could change a little bit depending on what that looks like. Right. So well, you know, let's uh, let's keep track of how things are going and uh, let's keep sharing that, right? Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. So what are we going to be talking about today, David? We're going to be taking a look at death, and this was a subject that I suggested. Wow. So why did we, I guess, why are we going to be talking about death? I mean, it's definitely one of the most different topics that we've talked about on the show. So why are we talking about death? Partly is it's timely. So if it wasn't timely, I'm not sure whether it would be something we should really get into in this moment. But a dog recently passed away in the house. The owners had a really, really hard time with it. Sometimes I've heard pets can be harder to get over than even people in our lives sometimes. I know that I've experienced quite a bit of death in my life. So, you know, it's a timely topic in in that sense, but it's also something that I've experienced quite a bit and something our listeners no doubt have experienced too. And not knowing how to deal with with it maybe sometimes as like a freelancer or a business owner or maybe just more ambitious person person that's trying to take life by the horns get more done and all of a sudden somebody dies i mean this is exactly the patterns that tend to play out in our lives when we're busy and we're trying to work towards goals so it's something we need to think about and process Absolutely. And, you know, and, and I know that when you told me about um, little Max, the dog here passing away, like yeah. it was different for me too, right? I mean, I come over and I've had an opportunity to just play with the dog and, you know, pet him and he just barks and he jumps on my leg and he's <laughs> a, you know, he was a fun guy and, and little guy, but you know, it's different. Like, you know, now when I do come over and we, you know, we're recording or we're doing stuff for the podcast here, you know, there's no dog, you know, coming and jumping on me anymore. You kind of start missing that feeling, you know, not that, um, you know, I can't compare my loss to the loss of the owners, obviously, but it is a, a little bit of something that I've also lost now because, you know, every time I came over, I did look forward to this little dog coming and saying what's up to me, right? Because mm-hmm. that's kind of the way he says what's up. He's just coming and kind of, you know, panting and wanting to be petted and kind of just kind of took off after he got his little fix, right? So it is a little different for everybody in the house. For sure. It is. Yeah, you've had the chance to sort of be part of that as well. And you might have known him for a shorter period of time. But for the time that I've lived here, I've pretty much known him the whole time that I've I've lived in this basement, I guess, the last four, not four years, but two or three years or so since about 2014. So, or end of 2013, I want to say. So that's something that's been that's been a part of my life as well. And, and he was kind of everyone's favorite dog around here. 
Right, oh, for sure. And I know there's two dogs here, and, and I saw a third one, uh, a different one the other day, a little small little guy too. So um, I don't know if that's a new dog in the house or is that... Uh... Well, it's a new dog in the house, but the owner's girlfriend is temporarily staying with us while she's moving. So that's really all that is. It's kind of a transitional thing. Right, so just temporary and then that dog is going to be gone soon. So Pretty much. Okay, so well, I guess, you know, since we have a really good reason to talk about death, I guess what's your first uh, thing that you like to talk about? Well, I want to get into this, and we actually did on a previous podcast kind of talk about sort of the cultural associations of of death as well. So that's going to factor into some of the things that I say for sure. Like if death is more accepted in your culture, then maybe it's not something that's as hard for you, but we'll get to that. Really, the first thing I wanted to talk about how death can be very unnatural feeling. And there are different theories as to why this is, or at least things that I've come across myself that I've been thinking about more and more is, you know, why does death happen and why does it feel so unnatural to us? One of the things that I thought about was sort of what the Bible makes reference to is the Eden, right? It was basically a place that was perfect. It was, it was a great place to be. You were surrounded by nature. You were surrounded by other animals. It seems like you could possibly even converse with, with animals. Really, any food that you wanted to eat that was available, you could eat it. So we kind of went from, the Bible indicates that we went from that place of being in the Eden to being cast out from Eden because of the sins that we've committed. Now, it sounds crazy, and I don't know if that is exactly how it went down, but it's at least an illustration of how things went from being perfect to not being as perfect. And now all of a sudden, death became a part of that as well. We might have lived eternally if we had still been in Eden or if we were still in Eden. But now because we're no longer in Eden, we don't have that opportunity to live forever. There is a finite time frame on our lives. And another thing to think about is just from the spiritual perspective, some people say that our souls are pretty much permanent. And in that sense, they're, they're eternal. They have no beginning and they have no end, or at least it, maybe they have a beginning, but they certainly don't have an end. So the spirit, even though the body passes away, the spirit still continues to exist long past that point. So those are a couple of thoughts and theories on, on why death feels so unnatural. Also, another indicator might be that the Bible indicates people live to be hundreds of years old as opposed to just dying at 80 as, as now the expected age has become. Right. Yeah, I think in some of the the characters in the Bible, I think they say it's like over 900 years old or something like right. that, right? So uh, it does show that it's potentially that there is a way to live forever, at least in, in that age, for whatever reason that was, uh, people were able to do so, right? And I mean, there's a lot of different theories on why uh, people were able to live that long. And I think that's definitely something we should discuss on a different show, because that's a little bit getting more into the, the, um, the reasons why someone can, right? You know, is it space? Is it something that uh, a book... Called called uh, Chariots of the Gods kind of talks about or indicates that, you know, if you were to leave the earth and, you know, people who can travel, space travel at the speed of light could live for a lot longer, right? So it is something we should definitely look at in another talk for sure. Well, my Um, meaning though is that it actually relates to the core topic or the core question that I just asked, which is why does it feel unnatural? So that's kind of my point there. See, for me, I don't think death is unnatural. And that's the problem. Well, See, yeah, it's and very I, tough for me to get at. And I also <laughs> and I also address that up front, right? Yeah. I said for some people, yeah. maybe this isn't true at all. But I think for a lot of people, at least in our, our North American or Western culture, it will be and it, it will feel unnatural to lose somebody. So it's beginning to think about why that is, because one day they're there and the next day they're not. Right. And I think that's maybe part of the disconnect is right there with myself, right? Because I mean, I, I grew up in an East Indian household, and and death is something that's definitely celebrated it's you know um just coming from that different perspective for example in hinduism uh there they have fires burning constantly in india where they have you know um sacred fires where you actually get the sacred fire and um and they cremate the person there right so it's it's a natural part of everyday life this happens every single day where people are being uh you know celebrated through the streets of India as they're being taken to their uh, cremation spot, right? So it's very different. So when I look at it, I can only give it from my perspective um, where it seems like a natural thing because it was something that was known. People know that, you know, it's, it, it's you always hear it, right? So either you're growing or you're dying, right? It's like a, a plant. If a plant grows, it's also going to die, right? I know one of the things where Buddhism uh, really 
started, or at least when Buddha started getting out of uh, his kingdom, right? Because he was a king, and this is a little bit more uh, into the story. But when he was actually finally allowed out of his kingdom and he went into nature, he started noticing that that there were people being uh, carried across in the streets, and he didn't realize why, because he had never known about death. So for him, death was unnatural at the time, because he had never heard about it or even seen it, because his dad protected him from it. But as soon as he got out and started seeing it, he started noticing that it was a natural part of life. Uh, you know, you pick an apple from a tree and that apple will die, right? It's not connected to the life source anymore. Uh, so it was in that respect, it's very hard for me, but I get what you're saying. Uh, I think if we start looking into North American culture, it can be a very unnatural thing because I don't think in, in North America, we really focus on death as much as we focus on living in the moment. Very true. And that really connects to my next point. And it's the same thing that you mentioned, because I know you, we've talked about this on a previous episode, is death celebrated or grieved in your specific culture. Because we do tend to pick up the beliefs and the habits and the attitudes of those people around us. And we spend a lot of time, I think, in North American culture, not appreciating life or appreciating life less. That's why we take it for granted. It's like we're just busy all the time, but we take those rare moments out to meet with our family members or friends that we care about or people that we care about. And then when they suddenly die, we go, gosh, I should have spent more time with them. But that's the whole thing of taking things for granted and talk constantly talking about life and not talking about death. So we have to, we do have to consider like, what does death mean to you based on your spiritual religious beliefs or your upbringing? Also, you know, Steve Pavlina also said, you know, the one thing we can count on in life is change. Everything changes and it's that willingness or ability to accept it is what leads to more acceptance and personal growth. So that was a concept that I was beginning to explore a little bit in, in 2007, 2008 as well. And I think there's absolutely value in recognizing that everything that is familiar now will change. Absolutely. And you know, one of the things you said about death being celebrated, right? I mean, um, in some even musical culture, for example, you know, if anybody listens to, for example, Tupac, one of the things he said was like, pour a little liquor, right? So uh, with the pouring of the liquor pretty much meant you're celebrating the life of your friend by, you know, spilling that alcohol, because maybe that's something that you guys would have shared together as a drink, right? So it is a way that that was being celebrated, right? The grieving of it, I know if you look at, for example, you go to any funeral home, I mean, you can see the grieving people, right? Um, and you can really see the pain, the hurt, because again, I think it does come to a point of understanding that we're not invincible, right? We are yes. going to die. These are bodies are temporary. You alluded that right to that, right? at the starting where you said, you know, your soul is not, uh, your soul is eternal, but this body is not, right? Or your soul can be eternal. And I'm going to definitely get into a little bit more about that because, yeah. you know, just like we talked about the uh, book that we talked about from Audible, uh, that was one of my points I wanted to really bring up and delve into. But, uh, you know, I think depending on the culture you come from or even your upbringing, death can be talked about in families and sometimes it's not mentioned and talked about in families. Yes. I know one thing I've probably mentioned to you as well is I've been blessed not to see a lot of death in my life. You know, I still have both my parents. I have all my family members. You know, there's been definitely deaths in my family. I'm not going to say that because, you know, my parent, my dad's sisters have passed away. Some, uh, my mom's family members have passed away, but they don't live here. They live in India. So I don't necessarily know them as much as, you know, maybe some of my close friends, right? So again, if that ever happened, that would probably be a hell of a lot more devastating than, you know, someone that I haven't quite met, right? And I think that's sometimes where humanity comes in is sometimes we don't grieve enough to the people that we don't even know. Very true. Well, I, and I think it can sometimes show up as tragedy. It can show up as trauma. It can show up as PTSD right? Post-traumatic post stress disorder. But it does definitely fundamentally come back to this idea of whether it's natural or unnatural from your perspective, from your upbringing, from your influences, from your spiritual perspective as well, if you have one. All those things are going to factor into whether or not it's something that feels natural. But there is an explanation for why, or at least there's possible explanations for why it might feel one way or the other. 
Right. Well, you know, one of the things that I wanted to kind of connect to this point that you're making is I think because we live in such a technology world right now, um, it's it's everything maybe doesn't seem real anymore. Right. I know uh, if, if anybody listened to this, listens to the news, you can't sometimes even tell if the news is real or fake anymore. I <laughs> honestly am having the hardest time because you hear such uh, differences that are being told by one side and the other side. And you have to try to figure out exactly what the truth is. And there's about 10 good points for one side and about 10 good points for the other. And and you can't, you know, you have to try to pick the truth. The truth is one side or the other. The truth can't be both, right? Unless it's a, you know, they're being spun to make you not believe that, right? So same thing in death. I think with all the technology we have, we don't sometimes unplug and say, you know, this actually happened and, and we don't allow ourselves the time to mourn either, right? I mean, the mourning, depending on how you mourn someone's death, that can be a great celebration and, and it's a great way to accept it. And I think, you know, if you look at any parent, for example, who's lost a, a lost a little baby due to, say, for example, a miscarriage or, you know, something uh, that's happened to the baby in their first year of life or something like that, I think for those people, that death is super real because, you know, it, it, it can happen to anybody at any time, especially if you're looking at a miscarriage situation. Well, you're right. There's a lot of talk and chatter. The problem is sometimes so much of it is just talk and chatter. It's, and it's nothing more than that. And by that, I mean, you know, this is maybe a concept that you also picked up in, in network marketing there, Mav. If you want to find out what somebody's true motivations and intentions are, watch their actions and not what they're saying. And so much of the political talk, so much of what's happening in the world is all about talking, 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 talking. We can never tell what a person's true intentions, true motivations, true character are until we witness their 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 character and their actions firsthand. Right. Well, you know, even when people die, not necessarily in physical body, but you'll see that in the news, for example, people's characters are being assassinated. Yes. Right. So, for example, you look at someone like Bill Cosby. He started off, you know, uh, as a as a teacher, and then he started teaching people, and then he went into TV shows, and and he's been very good. He's been always a lovable guy, and you see him as a father figure. And a lot of people have seen um, Bill Cosby as a father figure growing up in the '80s and in the '90s, and he, being Captain Kangaroo. I remember watching him on that show. I mean, it was pretty crazy, and you know, and, and only a couple of years back, you know, you hear all about these allegations that were made against him and really they assassinated his legacy, right? So they've killed off his legacy. And what does that mean to somebody like him who's still alive? And and when he goes you know, when he dies, what are they really going to say about Bill Cosby now, right? Was he a great teacher and a great comedian? Or was he just some sex maniac who, who killed a bunch of, you know, not killed, but he, uh, well, I guess he would have, if he did these crimes, he would have killed these people, not physically, but he would have killed them mentally and morally. He would have maybe brought these women down, right? So it, it's very interesting. That's also why there's so much value in being a person of your word and why people like that are really hard to find. If you are somebody that does what you say you're going to do you are actually a rare individual (laughs) it's the problem happens when we assume everybody is going to do what they say they're going to do which is not necessarily the case right well you know one of the things that i was thinking about is this ties into a little bit i know uh maybe sharing a couple personal stories that you know of experiences that we've had like i know i said i haven't had a lot of people that i know that have passed that are super super close to me although i do know people who have passed away right i mean i think we all know people who have passed and and uh, people i've met here in calgary people i've met in different areas and you know just for myself for example i've had friends who've passed away from like cancer and stuff right so one of the the times that uh, when i first had met my wife here and we had to go to see Seattle because of one of her, her cousin's uh, husband had passed away from cancer. This guy was the most healthiest guy uh, a, a, that I can imagine, right? I mean, this guy was cut. He was physically, uh, a, a physical specimen, realistically, right? Mm. He, was, he was muscular, no fat on him. He ate very healthy, didn't eat anything bad. You know, one day he was healthy. Next day he had stage four cancer. Mm. And it was unbelievable because, and, and it was unknown. Like no one had a clue and he he was perfect, right? You know, and and they he passed away and, you know, we had to go to that. But from that moment, it taught me as well, right? That, you know, cancer doesn't care. It really does not care who you are, what you look like. If it, you know, if it's within you, it's going to find a way to get, you know, that genetic change will happen so it, it manifests itself. And if it's not in you, I mean, you have to really do have to watch the food you eat and it's hard, you know, because you got to also think about the air you breathe too, right? You go to countries like China and India, yeah. that air is so bad. And if you're breathing in that kind of air, you know, what kind of damage are you really doing to your lungs and your muscles and your other organs? Absolutely. 
And I've shared the ex- example of my dad passing away. So you might recall that story from, from an earlier episode of the podcast. And there's many examples I could share, but maybe I'll just st- stick to some of the more significant ones, like my cousin taking his own life in a barn and him passing away, or my grandpa passing away from re- repeated heart attacks. And so, you know, those are some of the things that, that I carry with me. I would say some deaths are harder than others. I, I guess my uncle one of my uncles also passed away recently too. And I think I shared about that, but some of them impact you in different ways, right? Like my grandpa passing away initially was very hard, but then it became a thing of peace and joy and, and celebration. And my dad passing away has had, if you know, close to a lifelong impact on, on who I am and what I do and my passions and the person that I've developed into. So that one is obviously one of the most, most significant, but those are some examples that I could certainly share and talk about. For sure. And, you know, um, when I met my grandparents, like I never actually met my uh, mom's grandparents uh, or my mom's parents, sorry, sorry. So my grandparents from her side, uh, the only time I ever did meet my mom's grandfather was when I was 10 years old and we were actually going to India because my mom was told, uh, you know, you should come here now because your, your dad's only got a few days to go, right? So we had gone and traveled to India. So I met him on pretty much his deathbed and, and two days after my mom showed up, he passed. So I really, I still remember that image of him, but again, I didn't really know who he was I remember crying and I remember uh, my mom just being completely devastated mm. when her dad passed away and I I got I understood what had happened but again I, I wasn't connected to that but I, even though I felt emotionally connected at the time right and I mean I got to meet my uh, grandmother or my mom's mom and but again I didn't really know her and when she passed I, I really didn't know who she was, right? I mean, I'd met her one time that I physically could remember. I remember, I think I'd gone to India when I was two or three years old as well. And I mean, I don't remember being there. So I don't even remember meeting her back then either, right? So one physical time that I do remember, uh, my dad's parents, for example, they actually came and visited us in Montreal, was living with us in Montreal. And my my grandfather uh, from my dad's side taught me how to play chess and really got me engaged and using my mind by playing that type of game. And I had known my grandmother and stuff as well. And, and she had a strong stroke and kind of having to witness that not that she had died but she had you know she couldn't talk anymore and kind of watching that happen to her but again they didn't pass when they were in Montreal they had actually gone back to India after a couple of years and they lived in India comfortably for a couple of years and then they had passed right when a couple of years later so that did hurt me but again they weren't here so I didn't really get to go to the funeral I didn't get to really kind of see unfortunately you know kind of happy but sometimes it's good I think it is a good thing sometimes to see people struggle as they're going to pass because it becomes real because then you can actually see that this is real. These people are actually going to die, right? I mean, one day you hear about the person being here, the next day you don't hear about them anymore. Uh, it can be tough and, and to swallow and say, hey, you know, I actually understand what this means because you really don't. And if you don't see somebody for 10 years, 20 years, what kind of impact does that death actually have on you? Yeah, and I know what you mean because my grandmother at the age that she is, it seems like every time I see her, she's talking about two or three more people that have passed away, whether it's her cousins or extended family, even brothers and sisters, friends, and things like that. So, I mean, I don't necessarily have connection to all those deaths, but I do feel for her in the sense that, I mean, that can't be, that can't be easy to see your peers and your friends and your family and everybody that you've known and loved for all this time to be passing away kind of all at the same time. Right. And I think this is a story you shared a little while ago, too. I think you'd, you'd mentioned that your dad had passed in a motorcycle accident. Yeah. Right. So one of the things I remember when I was like 13 or 14, one of my good friends, we used to play basketball every day. And, you know, we're 13 and you go to school and after school, you're playing basketball till about midnight because it's still bright outside. Right. Sounds like my my 13 or my teenage years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And uh, but one day he's just like, yeah, my dad passed away in a motorcycle accident. We're like, what are you talking about? Mm. Like you're I just saw your dad, man. What are you talking about? right and it was here one minute and gone the next right and exactly. it was just crazy that that anybody can die from in a motor ac- motorcycle accident or you know but it was neat to see that he actually had taken care of his family because he had all the you know things in place he had the life insurance he had you know the mortgage insurance in case something ever happened to him so they were at least taking care of that way right but i mean these things can happen in a matter of a split second and no one really knows right and i think when he had passed uh, on the in a motorcycle accident he was i believe if i remember this correctly he was in the their left hand lane and there was a semi who had taken a wide turn and he had nowhere else to go but 
hit the semi. Right? Similar Which is, idea. Yeah, it's, it's just crazy, right? He was a great uh, motorcycle driver. He was very careful. But again, you can't control what the semi driver was doing or what another vehicle was doing, right? So in a split second that had nothing to do with his own control, he, he was gone, right? So, And some people do believe like we're all here for a certain amount of time. And we've served our purpose when we pass on, or at least we've served our purpose on, on earth or the place that we're living. And that might be a coping device of sorts in terms of, well, this person passed away. So for me to be able to deal with it, I just need to believe that they were here for that time, for that purpose, for that reason. But it, it can also help you in the sense that, I mean, they may not have known that that time was coming sooner rather than later, but they still lived out what they needed to live out and their purpose was served. Right. I think you said something, deal with it, right? That was the words you just used. And I guess, you know, asking you, how did you deal with your dad's passing? I mean, what have you, what did you do then? And what have you kind of, what have you continued to do to kind of deal with it or, or be at peace with it? Well, I mean, beyond the things that I've probably already shared about to a large degree, first of all, I don't know if there is any big picture way of dealing with, with that kind of tragedy and, and loss. But certainly watching my family members not deal with it, not cope with it, have a hard time with it, endlessly talk about it, got me to where, no, I don't want to do that anymore. I really do want to grow and expand and move beyond that in my life. My dad will always have that that place in my heart. He'll always be important to me. He'll have, he had tremendous impact on people in the, in the short amount of time that he was here into his early 40s. And, you know... It is hard for me to believe that he served, quote unquote, served his purpose in that time that he was here. But he really did accomplish so much to where I think it was it made more sense to move on and and work on myself at that point in my life, even even today or especially today, because I don't think I had that realization instantly. It made more sense to honor him by continually moving forward in my life. So coming to that realization was not easy, but it was part of that personal development process. It was part of reading books, listening to audios, processing the life events and things that had happened. And also just maybe even admitting to myself that, okay, be, what was the result of that? Why do I feel like I'm inadequate? Why do I feel like I'm weak? And even through my own addictions, that was part of my learning. It was like, okay, I am attracted to certain things because I lost this through through my dad. So I begin to find these keywords of exposure, right? Because when you don't have your father, when he passes away at 13, 14, that's what you feel. You feel exposed. You, you don't feel like you have that protective covering. So it was, it was really moving like that deep psychological or deep counseling or even deep group therapy work that I had to do to get into some of that. Right. Wow. That, that's pretty crazy because I know, you know, we've talked about this quite a bit and, you yeah. know, it's not something that I like to bring up, but it's something that I, I think it's a great topic to talk about because there's so many people who've been through the same thing. And I no mean, question. I've seen how you are uh, compared to some other people that I know that are, de- that mm. are dealing with death. And so I, I do bring it up on purpose because I think you, br- you deal with it a lot better than most people that have dealt with it or are still dealing with it. Right. So I think you're a great example on, on how to deal with something like that. Um, you know, just kind of give you an example of myself I, I think I've talked to you about uh, my um, my cousin's grandma right and I considered her my grandma and, and actually it's an interesting thing that both grandmas have actually come to me in a dream uh, one mm. came to me just one time that was my dad's grandma or my dad's mom sorry and uh, my cousin's grandma actually came to me in a dream I believe three times now and um, and, and in, in my last dream I had of her um, I actually got my closure right so I was really able to deal with that death because I never had I never had a chance to see her and in that dream, I asked her all the questions, and I remember just crying in my dream and and uh, talking to her and just asking her, "Why'd you die? Why'd you have to die? Like I never had a chance to see you." And I got to see her in my dream, and uh, you know she told me everything would be okay and don't worry about it and just live life, be happy and take care of, you know, everything I got to take care of and take care of my family. And, and it was interesting. She told me all that without saying a word. It was just being in her presence that told me all that right it was and that's how I got my closure it's been actually very interesting because I, right after I woke up and I messaged my cousin right away and I just told him all that and he's in Montreal also 
I had to tell him that because he was probably the, one of the closest people to her and uh, both my co- two cousins, right? Because again, sort of their grandma, right? But uh, I just felt that it was important for them to know that I finally got my own closure because I know they had a chance to probably get their closure there at the uh, um, the funeral. They were they were there, right? I mean, unfor- there are so many unfortunate circumstances I wish I could change and go back, but I mean, things are as they are, but I think that's why she came to me in my dream to let me know everything would be okay. You know, there's that movie with Matt Damon and I want to say Robin Williams. I think it's called Goodwill Hunting, right? There's that moment where he's in that counseling session with Robin Williams and he just repeatedly tells him, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. And and he breaks down, right? It's like that moment of, of sort of acceptance, but also realization that, well, he'd been you know, been so hard on himself and that that's part of what he was feeling on the inside. It wasn't anyone else being hard on him, but he was being hard on himself. And I've experienced something like that too, where I was in a, at a church in a service and I felt like God just came to me and just held me and said to me, it's okay. You know, it wasn't you, it's not your fault. I can't remember the exact words, but it was something along those lines. And it was just saying like, you know, it's okay. I've got this. Like I, I've taken responsibility for it. You don't have to. And that's really the story of the, the Bible, isn't it? That God takes responsibility for humanity. It's funny you said that. I was just thinking about that. I'm like, that gives people, you know, if you're stress-free, it gives you a reason to lift uh, the age of 900 or, yeah. you know, two, 300 because you put everything on God and let God take care of everything. So if you don't have to be responsible for it anymore, all you have to do is live day to day, be healthy and, and do the things that you need to do to provide for your family. I'm assuming that's exactly what they did in at those times potentially, right? Because if you've, if you've given everything to God, you're really giving it all to God. And, and by trusting and having faith is what they say is then that's where life can be given back to you. That's what you'll hear in 12-step groups as well, right? Let go and let God. That's like step one. Right. Wow. Well, you know, it's an interesting thing. I think I'm just kind of peeking at some of your uh, points over here. I, <laughs> um, but I think this goes right into what you're going to be talking about. I think it just gives a nice segue here too into what we've been talking about, plus what we can continue talking about. Uh, but one of the um, podcasts that I love listening to as well is called it's, uh, by Ram Das. It's called uh, Here and Now, right? Mm. And uh, and one of the things about that is he talks about what he's been doing for work, right? I mean, he's been working with the dying. So one of the things he will do is... And I don't know if he still does this uh, because he is pretty, uh, he's about 80-ish or I believe uh, years old now. But uh, one of the things that he was doing is he would actually go and sit with the people who are dying and talk to them and just be with them and allow them just to talk to him and and, uh, tell their story and express who they are and, you know, let those emotions out because, you know, Mm. give them that outlet of of people to talk to. And I mean, that's one of the things that he did and, 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 I think it really does provide a, a place for people to just finally connect to somebody in real life because, you know, so unfortunately not everybody can be at the deathbed of their family member or a friend or whatnot as they go through all these hard times, right? Uh, I mean, even sometimes parents, you can't be at your parents' bedside because, you know, if it's a prolonged, you know, death, for example, it's very hard for be there. You will make your best efforts to be there. Absolutely, I do believe that for a lot of people. But, you know, sometimes just having a stranger sitting there and listening to you and just talk it's so liberating because you can really just about tell anything to a stranger about yourself right and then he'll he talks to the people and he'll just kind of maybe tell them that you know things will be okay i'm not really too sure what he says but i mean i'm assuming that he's maybe telling them a little bit about guiding them you know into the next step of life and into death as well Hmm. fascinating yeah i wanted to talk a bit about grieving right which definitely connects to what what you're talking about and the reason I bring it up too is because unfortunately in North America I certainly can't speak for other cultures or countries we don't have a process for grieving and it seems ridiculous maybe to some people that we would even have to stop and think about it or learn about it like read it in a blog post or something but like gr- grieving really is if, if it's something if you don't do it I've seen the effects of what happens I think you you were hinting in that too Mav that like you've seen friends with parents pass away or whatever and their life trajectory led them down maybe a much more harmful route or a route that isn't exactly supportive of their full potential or who they could become or absolutely any, yeah. yeah stuff like that so uh, if we don't learn how to grieve then we might carry that with us and we'll bottle it up and that's the unfortunate tendency that i see a lot of the time so i think first of all taking time certainly during the funeral but the time leading up to it so when you first find out somebody has passed away you're going to be in shock 
more often than not, at least at least here in North America. So you're gonna you're not gonna be able to necessarily accept it in that in that moment, but you eventually come to that realization, right? They're no longer with us. So when you reach that point, if you don't grieve, if you don't let, begin to let those emotions out, you will begin to bottle them up and you'll, you won't be able to process them later. Now, some people do process in public. Some people do process in private. So I'm not telling you to weep your eyes out in public if that, for whatever reason, that doesn't seem like the right setting or you're still in shock or you're not able to do it. But if you are able to do it and you are there, then I would encourage you to weep. I would encourage you to cry. I would encourage you to voice how you feel, what what happened and what that person meant to you and to begin to express that in words to the people around you. And if nobody's willing to hear it, tell it to the wall. There's nothing wrong with, absolutely nothing wrong with that. But to begin to let it all out, if you're a songwriter, writing songs is a great way to begin to express that and to begin to achieve healing. I know Eric Clapton wrote, you know, tons of songs about the son that passed away in an unfortunate accident. So there's, there's so many ways to express it and to let it out, but not letting it out is what causes a huge problem. Right. And I think one of the biggest things that uh, are a really issue in North America is the fact that even if, you know, you tell your boss at work, for example, that, you know, somebody that you know really close to you has passed away, they only give you so many days off work yeah. as well. Right. And that's probably one of the biggest problems here in North America that I see is, you know, you have maybe three days off, five days off and you're back to work. You know, you got to go focus back on your 40 hour work week or your, you know, 60 hour work week or whatever it is that you're putting in. Right. And have you really given yourself the time to understand what what just happened or have you had the proper time to grieve like you're saying and just cry or or talk to somebody or get into art or get into poetry or whatever you need to do. go for a walk by yourself and then sit on a park bench and break down by yourself whatever you need to do yeah. but have you given yourself that time right and some people definitely don't and I mean it takes a long time and you know unfortunately I believe in North America a lot of people especially men are 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 used to bottling a lot of emotion up, right? So yeah. what we do is we're told from little kids, don't cry, don't, you know, don't cry, you're a man, don't worry about it, right? Be a man, grow up. And we're told these things. So we, when we come to those times of death, we hear those things in the back of our head. Hey, grow up, be a man, real men don't cry. And, you know, only little kids cry, little girls cry. That's kind of what we hear, all these derogatory statements towards women put back on men. And we're told, don't be like them. But, you know, in reality, why aren't we being like the ladies who can show that? emotion exactly. you know why are we always just being logical right it doesn't make sense to me so it, it does make sense to grieve but if we don't get that proper time that we need off you know it can be very tough and I, I understand the the uh, company's position that you might work for yeah they need somebody in the chair to do the work so they can make money off of you being in that chair because they're paying you money right but again how effective of a worker can you be when your mind is not at work, right? I've seen that tons of times as well, just all the different jobs I've worked and people end up either quitting or they just get into a depression state of mind mm -hmm. and, and it's just a bad cycle to get into, right? So um, I think grieving definitely at the right time can happen too because sometimes I, I think like you were saying, it doesn't always happen at the right at the, the exact time, time of death, right? It does take a lot of time sometimes to process what just happened. Yeah. Then that is one of the major challenges you identified there, Mav, is just the people around you. How do they respond? How do they react? Many people don't know how. I think it's one of the major things that the owner of, of the dog of Max is going through too is there's lots of people going like, are you okay? Can we go out? Do you want to do something? And and she doesn't, you know, the owner doesn't want to do, do anything. And it just depends, right? Sometimes you do need those people around you just to, to hug you, to encourage you, to help you, to to talk to and sometimes having those people there could, could be you know harmful to the overall grieving process or again depending on if whether or not you're bottling up things so yeah people is a major challenge work is a major challenge i found that sometimes having something to plunge back into is helpful but still within the context of that you know processing it is super super important Right. And I'm going to ask you, maybe play devil's advocate a little bit because I love doing it. And, uh, you know, <laughs> what about the fact that sometimes when people are grieving and people are coming up to them and say, hey, man, are you OK? Do you need a hug? Do you want me to cook? Do you want me to clean? Do you want me to do this and that for you? Do you want to go out? Let me take you to a movie or whatever. People like that sometimes. They want that additional attention. So they don't allow themselves to grieve properly or fully grieve. And, they, and then they want their friends to continue to come to them and ask them about it, right? Because some people do live in that space where they want the full attention on them. What do you think about that type of situation? 
well, it can be, first of all, it can be too much for sure. For some people, they can't even handle that level of, of people helping them out from day to day and getting things through. But for people who are perhaps addicted to that attention could also be unhealthy in other ways too. It, I mean, it's just showing you that you're not getting your needs met in your, in your day to day life, whether that's relational or friendships or just the way in which you deal with yourself, your relationship with yourself, because that's really where it all begins. So are you meditating? Are you journaling? Are you beginning to consider your thoughts and considering your own insanity? Because we all have (laughs) our thing. Every one of us has a part of our thinking that is wrong. So you're, you're addicted to that because you don't feel like you're getting enough of it. So what is at the root of not, not enough? And for me, that's not a hard question to answer. Like if I was in that situation, I'd say, well, not enough of my father is part of that feeling of not having enough, but not having enough, you know, continuing to think that way would lead me down to a path of debt, would lead me to a to a point of desperation and, and not getting my own needs taken care of. So you have to think about your, your, needs and why those needs are not being met right no great answer right i just wanted to kind of play the other side of the card sometimes there are people who are no it can be it can be too much math absolutely yeah and but people like it sometimes people like the additional attention people don't want to sometimes leave that place where then they can start to grieve they like to be in this limbo zone where they say you know if people continue to ask me i feel important that you know this event happened to me right so they make it about them versus about the actual person who may have passed away right because in actuality we should be focusing on the life of the person who passed away not only on the people who are affected by the life or the death of the person right so i mean definitely we should be talking to people and helping them out and helping them grieve absolutely don't get me wrong but i know sometimes it can become overboard for the person because some people are mentally just wired to take advantage of stuff like that maybe not on purpose but you know they like being in that spotlight uh even if it's for a short term yeah absolutely and i think you know, if you have a family member pass away and you begin to observe, you know, when you're together with your family, you begin to observe different family members, how they take on different roles or different responsibilities within that. So you might have somebody that like is acting as though they were completely fine and are trying to meet all the needs of the other family members. Again, that can also be dangerous. So that's why I say like, we don't have a process for grieving and everybody's process may be different, but we need to have one and not just take things on arbitrarily. Like if you're the kind of person that wants to take over their whole lives, make sure that you're done grieving or at least you've processed it to the point where you feel that you're able to help. If you're on the receiving end of the help, consider the person's state. Are they okay? Are they in a position to help you? And if you are, you know, addicted to that, then consider, you know, whether or not that's actually going to help with your, your health, your mental and emotional health long-term. Right. And you know, you actually got me thinking here for a second. And, and just because of the, uh, my next point really is to talk about the Tibetan Book of the Dead a little bit. Mm-hmm. And uh, my thinking was, and you something you had said again at the start, right? If your soul never really goes away, then what is the actual point of grieving if you understand the person will come back eventually? Is there really a value in grieving then? Because you know that person's soul will come back. Well, does the person come back or... I mean, because that could be a process of, let's say, reincarnation or like a, a future life or a new life. Or is is that a process of a soul moving on to something different, whether that's enlightenment, whether that's heaven, whether that's uh, space or, you know, a planet beyond one that we don't know about? If that's the process, then the soul doesn't actually return, but it has moved on to a new plane or a new dimension where perhaps it is always present in a way. Right. So I think this is where maybe talking about the Tibetan Book of the Dead may actually make sense. So one of the things that the book actually starts with talking about is um, there's two states, right? So there's, there's a point where you're about to pass away and there's the point the, the directly the minute after you've passed away right mm. so for the people who are passing away i think that's where someone like ramdas comes in he's sitting with them talking to them guiding them and then there's the people who are about that have passed away right and this is the book actually is a book you and and phrases in the book that you actually read to the people uh and what those phrases do is are actual guidelines on kind of what to do once you've now passed away right so uh it talks about the first 14 days um the the person has an opportunity to find enlightenment 
enlightenment. And if I, and this is my, again, my belief is if you find enlightenment once you've passed away, then potentially, yes, you move on to maybe another dimension, another universe, another planetary, maybe become a different being, enlightened being, you don't come back, your soul finds peace. I'm not too sure exactly what happens. Again, I've, uh, you know, if I look at it as karmically, maybe I've done this uh, route a million times. Right. So maybe I still personally have never found enlightenment, although maybe I get enlightened more and more every day. Um, but if we look at the way uh, the book is stated, right, the, the person is now reading it to the, the, the deceased, right, and saying, you know, guiding them through. So what it says is the, the people should actually not grieve while the book is being read and the person is being guided towards enlightenment. The reason for that is uh, as soon as the person can still hear, because if I can still hear, uh, you know, if you can hear me talking, then you are still have awareness. But if you start hearing crying, then then you start saying, well, why is there crying? You know, what is go- actually going on? You start awakening to the fact that you've passed away. And if once you w- awaken to the fact that you've passed away, that's the idea they say you'll have rebirth and you'll come back, right? And if you look in the title of it, it's to find liberation. Liberation is finding it through, uh, in, in this case, because it is a Buddhist text or a Buddhist book, you're, you're, you're being visited by the Buddha in different forms. And uh, each form is, if you, if you can recognize it in the first 14 days, that each form is Buddha coming to uh, give you your liberation or your enlightenment. Uh, you you follow Buddha in, in this path, and this is what they say is, and then you will find your enlightenment. And maybe you're right; you'll move on to a different plane. Uh, but if you do not, you continue through this cycle, and and you go through it over and over and over again, and you find rebirth, right? And they even talk about how at rebirth you can actually still find liberation. Um, but again, if, if you don't realize it, they say it's pretty much. It was an interesting thing. So when I was reading it, uh, the book itself, and it goes through saying, we, a lot of people say, you know, I never chose you, mom and dad. You know, you decided to have me. And But the book actually looks at it a different way and saying, mm. while you're in this limbo state, you actually choose the womb you want to be born into. The womb doesn't choose you. So I thought that was a very interesting perspective to look at as well. I've thought about that too. And I think those are all really good points for us to think about. Have we lived many lives? Are we just repeating a process that we've already gone through? And this, the I've talked about this before. Like we chose to be, we, it's possible that we all chose to be a part of this life or to live this life or to have this particular experience. I couldn't tell you why, but maybe even in spirit state before you were ever born into this physical body, you thought about, okay, I want this experience. Who am I going to be born to? Which parents would I like to have? And even the, your, your DNA, well, you maybe had endless options, right? Or maybe you had many options to choose from. It might not be endless, but there were going to, there were people going to be born at a certain time frame, And you said out of those, I would like to be this particular one. I've thought about that for sure. And here's an interesting statement that I was thinking about just uh, when I was reading that book. So, just, you know, this might be a little bit, uh, uh, you know, different than a different thought process. And I hope if it, uh, you know, if we got little kids listening, you know, maybe cover their ears or something, but I'm not going about to swear. So nothing like that. <laughs> but um, if you think about a lady having her period, right, what that means is an egg came down from the ovaries and was supposed to attach to the wall, but it didn't have a chance to attach to the wall. So it, it, it flushes itself out through the period. Now, if you think about every single egg as being a possible birth, right, with the egg and then with the sperm and the ovum, so is it possible that every single soul, every single egg is a soul, and every soul that every period was a soul that didn't have a chance to be reborn? So only maybe two souls or one soul or three souls are typically born to each person. So for all the persons, maybe all those people, all those eggs that didn't have a birth were maybe all people who are liberated and found enlightenment and not and then get come through the uh, the birth way, right? So just a different way of thinking, looking at it, is it possible? Well, you could say the same for the male process too, right? With sperm. Yeah, absolutely. Right for every one, and I mean, there's a billion of them. So is is only one that does find the egg? So what happens? What about the other ninety nine? No, nine hundred ninety nine million or whatever it is. So what about those? Yeah, you're right. Could they have been a different form? Like you know, I look at the sperm part of it as a different form of yourself, right? The egg is typically it is only one, but the sperm are a whole bunch of them, right? So it could you could become any number of the billion versions of yourself or whatever the exact number is, right? So it's very interesting. You're right. Or even the male time a month. I mean, the reason this never comes up is because we are quite good at self-pleasuring ourselves. But if we didn't, we would still have, quote unquote, a time a month. And we lose during that point too, right? We lose sperm. So 
No, for sure. And I mean, even with that said, for example, if you're dreaming, right, sometimes if you don't self-pleasure yourself, you will have a dream and your dream will pleasure yourself. More often than not. Yeah, exactly. So it's a very interesting way to look at it too, right? Because there is something to do with the egg and the sperm for sure and birth and rebirth and, and, and death as well. Because for every, you're right, for every egg that passes or for every sperm that doesn't, doesn't do its job, you know, you are potentially losing millions and millions uh, of potential versions of yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we even mentioned that people tend to focus a lot on how to live, but I still felt like this was a really important part of this whole conversation on death is really ultimately how will you live? Because you will have, you do have a limited time. We all have a limited amount of time. So we don't necessarily know how we're going to die. Like you may have identified a sickness or a ca- or plausible cause at this point, depending on where you are in, in your particular lifespan. But most of us don't really know what what we're going to die from or how we're going to die. So we get to think about how we're going to live and what we want to experience and what we want to enjoy, what we want to see, what we want to do, the people that we want to meet and interact with and get to know. So we have choices in all those things. So we should really think about goals. We should think about countries we want to visit, making your bucket list. I mean, there's many different ways of approaching it, but having a big picture of what it is that your life means to you, setting a theory and then putting that in motion. So having a course to follow is really important. It's too late to think about it on your deathbed and most people do. So really creating a really good theory or what you think is a a close approximation of what life is about and living that now. Right. And that's if you have a chance to reflect on your deathbed, because not everybody gets that pleasure, right? And sometimes death is spontaneous. You know, there's so many different ways to die, right? So, um, it can be very tough, but if, you know, it's interesting. I read a, a book uh, a little while back. It's called Tuesdays with Maury, right? So it was about a gentleman who um, was, in this case, Maury, uh, who was uh, suffering from ALS. You know, he found out he had ALS. So he, it's a it's a disease that takes a long time as it, as it just completely breaks down your body. Like a um, degenerative. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, you most people probably remember it from the ice bucket challenge. That's what ALS was about, yeah. right? To, to bring awareness, to collect some money for it and, and really... Tr- look for ways to uh, find a cure for it, right? But what he did was he knew he was going to die. So what he did was he said, well, how can I best use my life while I'm living? Because I can't really, you know, he couldn't move after all. He couldn't walk. And after, you know, and he knew as soon as it got to his lungs, it was over, you know, and and, and, and he knew it, right? And as soon as he, had, he couldn't breathe for himself, right? So he, what he did, one of the things he did was he actually had a, a living funeral, so that was him still being alive. And he said to all the people that he loved, hey, come to my funeral and tell me what you think about me and tell me about me and share the stories that you were going to share at my funeral but to me while I'm still alive so I can still hear it. And I can enjoy the laughter and I can enjoy the tears and I can enjoy what you're going to say and I can look at you and enjoy the emotion and, and everything. And, and it went really well. So why don't we do that enough? One. And the second part was, he, you know, he sat with one of his favorite students. In this case, uh, his name was Mitch Albrum. And, and he wrote the book, actually. And, and he talks about, Mitch talks about how he, what, all the things that he learned from Maury as his teacher, right? And, and he'd actually go over every single Tuesday to his house. So he'd fly from, uh, fly from, I believe, uh, Detroit all the way to where Maury was living. And it's actually an old um, uh, interview you can actually find on YouTube uh, with Ted Koppel, right? And and even with with that interview, Ted Koppel is known as, you know, the, the, the professional, not going to cry, but he even made him cry and kind of break down and really start feeling for what was happening and, and not just make it about a story, right? He really got down into the emotions of who Ted Koppel was and, and really started even developing potentially a friendship with him too, right? So, but he found ways to live while he was dying by teaching people how how to live while you still have the chance. So I thought that was a brilliant book. And there are even stories like real life stories or even movies that talk about this concept oftentimes, right? Somebody is finds out they're diagnosed and they find, find out they're about to pass away. They might have three months or whatever. So then they reprioritize their life and then they think about what would I like to do? Where would I like to go? What would I like to see? Who would I like to connect with? And some people, because of all those experiences, continue to live on. Some of them unfortunately do pass away, even though they experienced all these awesome things in life. But not all of us, like you said, Maveen, get that opportunity. We don't necessarily get diagnosed and then we know that we're going to die in two months. It could happen suddenly. So we don't have that opportunity. Now is that time to think about that because we're prompting you on this podcast. So if you have a chance to just sit with yourself and write it down, do that. 
Absolutely. And, you know, I think sometimes we forget to tell the people we love that we love them as well, right? Because, oh, yeah. again, no one really knows what their expiration date is. And and if you expire today, oh, I'm sorry, and, you know, I, I do, you know, hope your soul peace. But, you know, if you live on for another 30 years, who will you tell that you love them? Who will you, what are the things you're going to do? How will you make an impact on the world? Because, again, you'll never know uh, when tomorrow comes because sometimes tomorrow doesn't come, right? And, and today, and I think that's where that statement really comes from, too, is, uh, tomorrow never comes for a lot of people right and tomorrow really ju- is just today reborn right so um just look at those ways of looking at it and thinking about it as well yeah and that's the way i've begun to interpret that phrase as well and i mean it really just means t- we try to live in three different life states when that's truly impossible you can't live in yesterday although you can recount the memories and you can't live in tomorrow even though you can begin to think about what you want to accomplish or you could begin to think about your anxieties and fears about tomorrow but tomorrow is just another today and then after that is just another today and after that is just another today Absolutely. Well, you know, and it's, it's funny because it's still true. I'm sitting here and we're recording this, but, you know, I got a hundred different things I can think about that I have to do right after this podcast. And, <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm not thinking about them. I'm sitting here in the moment, focusing on our conversation and focusing on the podcast because it's important. If it wasn't important, then I, I shouldn't be doing this, right? So whatever you're doing right now, you know, if you're listening to this podcast and doing something, if you're just sitting down, taking notes or, or whatever you're doing, you know, what do it the best you can while you're listening to this as well, right? And, and go out and definitely enjoy and tell people you love them and, and share, you know, share a little bit of yourself, share your wealth because wealth is health and health is, you know, wealth is also a way to uh, show people you care about them, right? Because you can't take it with you. That's the only the major thing about money is you can't take it with you. So even if you've got hordes and hordes of it, what good is it to you? Because it, it can only buy you so much health. It can only buy you so much, you know, fancy th- material things. But, you know, once you die, all those fancy material things that you had go away and really what you're left with is hopefully a memory to other people that you impacted. And hopefully you have a long-term view of that because you could potentially have a legacy where you do pass that on to your children and your children's children and, and beyond. So now the money does have a purpose, but the purpose now extends beyond you and beyond what you can see and beyond your own lifespan. So it's important in thinking in that way too. But also a really good point there, Mav, you made was this thing about trajectory. So... If, mon- if you made the theory that life is about money and I need to earn as much money as I possibly can, you know, you need to think about whether that's truly going to be fulfilling for you or not. For, for some people, it may be, but it doesn't give you the experience necessarily to experience life, experience nature, experience, you know, getting to know different people and building relationships and things like that. It might actually end up being a hollow, narrow minded life that doesn't involve anything other than work, 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 and more work. And no, some of those, right. some of the people do get married, but I hear they don't have great marriages. I wonder why. Yeah, no, you're right. And, you know, it, it, it's funny, you made me think, because if you look at statistics, statistics say that most people probably only make about, let's say, an average about thirty, maybe $40,000 a year, right? On yeah. An average. You know, there's people we know that make a lot more. There's people that don't make any because they're on some sort of government assistance. But on average, if you're looking at about 30000 years, uh, 30000 a year, now, if you were to be able to earn, let's say, $50,000 a year, but residually, where it's ongoing, it's incoming, do you need to be a millionaire? No, you have, you know, an additional, well, you are, well, you are in a way, but That's you're not a mis- multimillionaire or, you know what I mean? You don't have a million dollars coming in. You have $50,000 a year. 30,000 is really all you needed to live the old life you were living. So what could you do with the additional $20,000 and eight hours of your day back because it's coming in now residually? And I've, I've heard some very smart people say essentially that if you're making 5k a month passively, you are in effect a millionaire, right? But if that, over that's going to happen over the long term, like you said, Mav, you're not an instant millionaire, it just means that you have enough money coming in regularly that you don't have to work for will eventually make you a millionaire. Well, exactly. And, and I, I don't think we sh- I think that's where sometimes people focus is I'm going to work myself to death trying to make a million dollars a year. Yeah. Well, you know, most people would be happy. Uh, you know, I've heard a statement if, you know, to bring your wife home as an example, all you need to do is create another $400 worth of income on top of, you know, whatever the male's income is, let's say, for example, and, and that could bring your wife home. 
because that'll cover mo- more than enough of all the yeah. bills because you don't have as many as expenses anymore, right? Depending on, again, you look at the way you look at your lifestyle, look at that, but what could an additional $400 a month do for you? Uh, you know, I mean, that was one of the things I used to always hear in network marketing, but then I started actually thinking about it. I said, you know, what? $400 is not, it's not, they're not lying to me. It's, it's true. very true. Yeah. You know, how it's would crazy. my life change with $400 and how could I actually start living now before I die? And it's not strictly a thing of happiness, although money does provide options. Basically, there are studies showing that none of us get any happier than we are if we make more than $70,000 a year. So there could be a tangible difference leading up to that point. Like if you go from 40 to 50, 50 to 60, 60 to 70 year over year, then there might be a tangible difference in your happiness year over year. But past the $70,000 dollar point apparently there's no difference between how happy you ultimately are in terms of how much money you're making right and i'm not sure about that um overall i mean that's that's a great thing and it's possibly true but i look at it as you know if i'm making say for example seventy thousand dollars this year uh, i start looking at my lifestyle and i start living to that seventy thousand dollar lifestyle and then once you start living at seventy thousand dollars what typically ends up happening for most people is they start living over that seventy thousand dollar lifestyle absolutely that's where credit cards come in and then so they go back to work or they start working a little harder they start creating more and then they start getting to eighty thousand dollars and then they get to do the exact same thing so it's a this cycle of always wanting more and you're never happy with what you have well that's the part of the equation that that is problematic because we can't account for personal differences a lot of people will spend their monies in ways that they see fit which may not necessarily be the right way if you were earning it year over year or if you had to build up to it then you would have more respect for money a greater understanding of how to manage it and handle it but if it's suddenly thrown into your lap you're right so many people don't have self-control they don't know what to do with it they don't know how to manage it everybody is suddenly asking them for money so that they can pay off their debt meanwhile you haven't even touched your debt because you you think you have unlimited resources you do not and you end up spending it so so those kinds of things you can't really account for right and you know it's even fun it's even funny because when i first was working at the bank i found out you know when it was coming down to tax season it was like you know you get taxed when you're alive and then you get taxed when you're dead right and i was like what are you talking about you get taxed when you die he's like absolutely you, you know your your estate gets taxed and because you know you've built such so many assets so it's an interesting thing that you know if you think money is the only thing in this whole world then you know when you die i guess you don't have to worry about it but to people who are living absolutely you know if you can make money you can put some away and you can sell up the right businesses where you know things are happening and, and you have a passive income set up we don't have to worry about always using your physical body to work yeah then you can go out and do all the things you want to do but you know if, if you don't have that chance because not everybody wants to have a business of their own some people are more than content of working nine to five working for somebody else and, and that's okay because we need people who are doctors that are working for mm-hmm. hospitals we need people who are uh, taxi drivers who are working for the, the citizens of the city right um, we need those kind of people and there's nothing wrong with it. But if you don't know how then to save your money at that level of the life that you've chosen to live at, it can be huge problems, not for you, know, not for you because you've passed away, but for the people who you've left potentially a whole bunch of debt for. But the key thing that I wanted to just drive home was it's not about the dollar amount that I really want to talk about. It's about happiness, right? Because I was talking about happiness. Happiness does not increase past $70,000. And that that was the key point that I really wanted to, to bring up. And like Derek Sivers recently wrote a brilliant post that said, if you spend 50% of your time working at a job or whatever provides the funds that you need for your life and your other 50% of your time working on what makes you happy creatively, what you know for some people that'll be music or songwriting or whatever or building your business then you will achieve like he says those are the happiest people he knows is people who spend 50 percent building their life 50 percent building their dream yeah no i i can understand that because i'm thinking about it too it's like like i said with most people are only used to making say thirty thousand dollars you know how much over and above that do you really need to find that comfortable spot where you can say, you know what, I'm happier now, right? If you continue to still live the way you're living, but still now have more time, more flexibility to do what you want, you would be happier making $50,000, $60,000. You don't need $100,000. You don't need $400,000 coming in to be happy. Absolutely not. I know it's like, uh, you know, like you always hear, more money, more problems, right? So (laughs) it's the true fact is the more money you make, the more headaches you will have, right? And if you live at that spot of, you know, $70,000, if that's the number we're talking about, uh, then, you know, make that and be happy there. But keep in mind, with that said, inflation will eat you alive as well. Yeah. No, it's true. I mean, some of the problems that can certainly come up 
is taxes. You might be charged more in taxes if you suddenly get a large lump sum. If you've been managing your money up to that point, you know to expect it, you know to save for it, you'll be able to handle it. But that's something I've seen in my business as well. Being a business owner is great, but guess what? Now you're responsible for higher taxes. Some of the other problems we mentioned too, like if you suddenly have uh, you know, when you win the lottery or something like that, well, then suddenly you have all these people asking for money and they just want a handout. They want a free ticket. They're not looking for to pay you back or to pay you back with interest or anything like that. They're just interested in themselves. And then that could ruin the relationship. Although to be fair, that might just reveal whether or not they're true friends. Right. And, you know, it's funny you say about the lottery because it's so true, right? You always hear about these crazy lotteries in the U.S., right? The Powerballs, or it's like 100 million plus, and it's just completely ridiculous. But not just the amount ridiculous, the stories that come from it, you're right. The, the same people grow, go broke within five to maybe eight years. Those, those same people who had $100 million went broke. How is that even possible? And, and one is because they don't know how to manage that money. You're right. And, and you know, people come up to them and say, hey, can I have this? Can I have that? Can you buy me this? Can you pay these bills for me? And, and the same people, they agree to pay their bills two years later are going back into the exact same amount of debt. And because, yeah. hey, you bail them out once. Hey, guess what? Can you bail me out again? And they'll do it again and then again and again. You do that over 10, 20, 30 friends. So how long does your money last? Right. And eventually you go broke because what you're doing is you're buying a bigger house, a bigger car, you know, two Lambos and you got a boat and you got a trailer, you got a huge house, you got an acreage you're sitting on and you forget that you still have to pay insurance and taxes and, and you still have to spend money to maintain everything you own. Right. Well, you've got MC Hammer, Vanilla Ice, <laughs> Tyson too, right? Mike Tyson. Yeah. I have all gone through various financial challenges. So yeah, it's not about an issue of the dollar amount, but I think in life and death, that's something you have to think about is how much money do you want to make? How much money do you need? How much money allows you to be happy and pursue the things that you want to do or enable you to have the options that you want? You know, it's funny. So in the answer sometimes is zero. You don't even need money to be happy. It's true. Um, because like we were talking about in other talks, like, you know, we're going to India, you see poor people and they're happier than people with money. And it's amazing because I never thought that was even possible being a little kid until I saw that in my 20s. I was like, wait a minute, poor, these people are dirt poor. They have nothing. They can't provide for their families, but they have this smile on their face that I wish I had on my face at that time, right? Mm-hmm. I was just like, I don't even have that. And I'm the one who traveled overseas to the, your country and spent my money, hard-earned money to come to your place and enjoy it. And I see you enjoying life way more than pretty much every single person I know. How is this possible, right? And, and there is something to be said that you don't need money all the time. What you do need is a good core people around you. It's interesting too, because a lot of the video games I think are wired to to get you addicted in that way too. Let's say like an old game like SimCity. Well, you start out making very, very, very little money when you build your city. The goal is to get to the point where you can start keep keep building and make it sustainable. But if you build too many police stations and fire station and you build too much infrastructure, then you don't have enough money coming in to continually expand and keep growing your city. So you have to build it in moderation. But If you do well, you'll notice that, oh, $10 came in this year, $30 came in the next, $50 came in the next, and gradually you can expense, but not much. So then you're kind of addicted to that process of getting a little bit, expanding, getting a little bit, expanding. So it's almost like we're wired for difficulty in a way, for challenges. Life without challenges is terrible. It's boring. It's mundane. You know, I've heard hell described as doing the same things over and over, not not getting any different results. That's hell. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, if you had to watch the same TV show every day for the rest of your life, every hour on the hour, uh, you know, that would be that would be hell. Yeah, Groundhog's Day. Exactly. Right? That movie kind of showed exactly what happens. It's going through the same routine over and over and over again. And, and that's what happens with people, right? We, we live in this uh, 40 year, 40 hours a week, a nine to five type job. And we go through that same routine. And then we end up on our deathbed if we're lucky, uh, to reflecting back and saying, man, I wish I would have done more. I wish I could have done more. And instead of wishing, I think, you know, the best thing is to go find what it is and start doing it and start actually living today versus living tomorrow, right? Because I think that's what you were saying. A lot of people 
focus on tomorrow and saying, ah, you know, I'll get it done tomorrow. Ah, it's okay. I'll do it tomorrow. And then really never get to it because your to-do list is endless and it just, you keep adding more and other things take priority over the things that you really want to do because it's always, it's easier to do the small things versus the big things. But mm-hmm. if you focus on the main thing, then you notice that the little things really don't matter anyways. So... Yeah, it's all small stuff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, I got uh, one last point to talk about, and and this is a little bit different, right? So, for example, this is a great uh, thing to look at. Hopefully, this never happens to either one of us for another 100, 200 years. But if, what if there was a death in a business, right? So we have a business here together, and what if something were to happen to one of us? Not necessarily physically, but what if one of us said, you know what, ah, I just want to, I'm done. I don't want to do these podcasts anymore. That would be a death of the business. Uh, you know, what would we do there, right? So that's something to definitely look at, especially because, there's a lot of business owners listening to this podcast and you know if your something happened to your partner your partner said no what would you do right uh, so it is important to have some sort of agreements in place I know we don't have one because we just have we're just going and we just starting this off we're just kind of getting it going and as we start getting into it I know we will probably look at uh, you know having something in place especially when we start focusing more on the monetary side of things right yeah. now we're not really monetary focused right now we're just really focused on getting good content out to and our building listener audience and, yeah exactly and, and get that audience to say you know what these guys are really really someone we want to learn from and these guys bring a lot of life experience or different kind of experience from work or from business or whatnot and and these are people that we can continue to listen to and yeah we would not mind paying down the road to potentially have some products from these guys right so that's what we're working on and working towards and when we have Mm. that absolutely then we'll discuss on how to set up the business but right now again if we were to focus on the small stuff we we would forget to record (laughs) You know, it's interesting. I I have a lot of experience with this, right? Because I have, I've been in bands that are no longer active. I've started businesses that are no longer active. I've invested in businesses that have gone belly up. There's various creative projects that I used to be involved in that I'm no longer involved in. There's blogs that I've started and stopped. There are various other projects, whether it's art or graphic design or websites that I started and stopped. So this kind of thing does happen quite a bit. <laughs> I think, you know, using your power is something we started because we believe in it. We believe in the concept. We believe we're bringing something different and valuable and interesting to the table. And it's something that we felt we could collaborate on and, and do well at. And I think we do, but nothing is permanent, right? So yeah, of course we, neither of us want to go through that, that process, but also entrepreneurs more often than not will build three or four or five businesses that are completely unsuccessful until they've arrived at that one idea that ultimately works. So we're, we're dealing with that reality too. I mean, it's a game of odds in a way we keep, we keep at it. We, if we're persistent and we believe in the concept and we keep building it and we keep at it, then our chances of success are much greater versus not doing anything at all or, or doing very little or not making any progress on it. The way in which we make progress on it right now is by sharing ideas and building that audience and people who are like-minded to us. And I think ultimately we will just attract people that are like us. Like if some people might come in, listen to it, not care for it, don't like it, don't like our personalities or whatever, and move on and go into some other podcast. And that's great. You know, we weren't the right one for you. Eventually over time, it gets honed down to those core group of people that do resonate. So yeah, for sure. And you said it perfectly, right? All we really want, would love to have is, I mean, we'd love to have a million listeners, hundred percent, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but really what, you know, when I started thinking about this idea and I when David thinks about this idea, you know, we're really just looking for a core group of, let's say, for example, a thousand listeners who are interested in listening and and, and uh, building that community with us and and working with us and helping other people and, you know, wanting to learn and, and share what they've learned with us and, and with the community, right? Again, we don't need a million people, but, you know, if we have them, wonderful. We have a larger community. But within that thousand people, we don't necessarily want to steal listeners from, you know, from people like, say, Pat Flynn or, or um, you know, Neil Patel or Tim Ferriss, you know, they have their their people, they have the people that listen to them. They Those same people may listen to us and they may enjoy us. Absolutely, we welcome you. But if you're the person that maybe listens to them and comes over and says, well, you guys aren't exactly like those guys. You guys are totally different. I really enjoy those guys' personality. Hey, no problem, like you said, right? Our personalities are not going to drive with everybody, but I do believe they will drive with over a thousand people. 
Absolutely. I don't see why not. So no, that's, those are really interesting thoughts there, Mav. But yeah, I think I just gave a lot of examples of death in business, death in creative endeavors, death in music, whatever it is, death in relationships. You know, you, you are married to somebody now, Mav, but you had relationships prior to that. Same with me. Like I'm not married yet, but I've had previous relationships. So, so things in, you know, life live and die, which I mean, pretty much ties in with my point, but I've said it throughout this whole thing. So there's no point in really like expanding on it any further, which is that, everything in life is temporary because there's death right well and i like the idea what you said like everything in life is temporary because that's true right even i think that's the idea right you come here and that's the like we said earlier that's the one thing that's unknown right? you can know and find all the knowledge in the universe that that we have in your lifetime let's say you can figure that out but the one thing that's temporary is you being here and you might be able to extend your life and and you know maybe there's somebody on this planet right now that has extended their life to five six hundred years old i mean i don't know right uh, there's a lot of stuff that we Nothing have no documented, clue but yeah right there's things that we have no idea what are going on on this planet there might be people who have the secret to cancer and have uh, maybe have they do have those medicines and they stay healthy by by doing that right I remember, I don't know if you remember this or not, there's that uh, uh, one episode of The Simpsons where Mr. Burns is so sick, he actually has all the different diseases living in his body, but because <laughs> he has so many of them, he they're, they're at a perfect state, so he never dies. So it's kind of interesting. So he's just like, I'm superhuman or whatever he said. But I think I've seen that. Yeah, yeah. it was funny, right? Because But he had everything, so he was just never going to die. But um, it's, there are probably people like that out there, and, and that's my little jab at the pharmaceutical industry because, you know, I think there is money to be made in death and I believe there's money to be made from death so I mean it is a morbid way to look at it but I do believe those things happen all the time there is more money in life in the sense that they can keep a steady flow or small flow of money coming in month after month after month that's how debt works essentially in debt collection that business thrives because people keep giving a trickle and not paying off the full amounts and also because i mean let's face it they're they are unscrupulous for the most part they're they're trying to take money from you that they have no legal right to because now they're representing a debt that yes might be true but they don't have all the documentation trust me on, and information on what the nature of that debt was they, they couldn't tell you what the exact credit card was even in some cases or you might have two institutions collecting debt on you at the same time which is also so not legal they cannot do that so so the whole de- debt collection agency works on that model of a little bit of money flowing into them every single month while you're alive and then hopefully they can pass it on to a family member who will continue to pay it long after their debt so yeah there's money in life and death it's crazy yeah absolutely i mean uh look at the amount of baby boomers that we have going to be turning you know uh, 60 plus and going in the next 20 years a lot of them are going to start probably passing due to unfortunate circumstances of health or even wealth you know a lot of them don't have all the money put in place because they spent a lot of that time enjoying their younger days and and as soon as they get to their 60s and 70s they realize oh crap i just ran out of money and and what happens from there right uh the stress of that having to go potentially go back to work and you know you hear about these sad stories all the time and and it does happen and sometimes which is so morbid to think about it's just horrible is sometimes it's easier just to take your own life mm-hmm. than have to continually deal with the, fa- the stress of going into poverty because a lot of these people have never lived with poverty in the way that they're about to experience so you know if you're somebody who's of, of that air age or you you know you maybe have parents of that age help them take care of themselves before they get to that spot because i do believe it is our jobs to make sure our parents are doing okay you know and that's valuable because people need to be thinking about the different perspectives that exist some people will say live life now you know while you're young do everything that you want to do don't worry about work don't worry about money don't worry about health and some people will say now's the time to plan there there just isn't a better time than now for you to begin to think about how you're going to live your life how you're going to prepare for retirement if you're planning on retiring what you're going to do be doing in the future and how you're going to be taking care of your health so really you got to think about what's right for you because people will tell you every which way right no you're right some people some people say have fun today go and do whatever you want to do and some people will say take care of it now but you you just got to figure that out for you yeah no i agree 100 percent. nice yeah do you have a summary or or what are you thinking Uh, i think my summary is essentially that in some cases death does involve grieving if we're still alive not always but grieving is often a part of death and then also celebration 
I think it is important to celebrate people's lives. And I think we do a somewhat better job of that here in North America. At least we're thinking more in terms of how do we celebrate that person's life and not just think about their, their death because really they had an impact while they were, they were here. And it could also be a thing of peace, you know, over time. It's not necessarily like a, a selfish thing to feel peaceful after someone has passed away. I think it's actually something that we, we should f- be feeling at least, you know, if we were to think that we have a God that cares about us and, and wants us to live a good life, then he should be providing that peace to us during that time of death. When, when do we need peace more? There just isn't anything anything of that sort. So, you know, death has many different dimensions to it and it depends on cultural attitudes. It depends on religion. It depends on spirituality and, and your upbringing. But so it's really hard to sum it up and put it in a, in a way that everybody can, can relate to necessarily, but it's just thinking about what does it mean to you and what, what impact and what influence does it have you on your, and on your life? Right. And, you know, I, I hear all the time, you know, your life is about that dash, you know, on your gravestone, right? Mm. It's about the dash. And what are you going to do to live your life uh, in that dash, right? So um, coming to your point about finding peace through death, absolutely. I think that's where meditation comes in, right? If you can meditate, you, you, you start getting connected to yourself. So you start understanding not only yourself, but you do start understanding life and death in meditation or from your meditation, right? And you can start then applying those things to people. And if you can find a way to have a better understanding, yeah, yeah, you're, might, you're still going to grieve. You're still going to have that experience and that, that you should experience when someone dies. Um, but uh, I think you'll have a, an easier time dealing with it through meditation. And even mm-hmm. if someone does mm-hmm. med- pass away, you've never meditated before, try a meditation after someone passes away and see how you're, uh, you're, you're able to grieve. And maybe you'll cry while you're meditating. That's okay. But at least you're by yourself and sitting in a room or maybe sitting in a chair uh, and, and you're just dealing with it, right? Because I think through that meditation, it could be a huge way of just lifting that weight off your shoulder. That's a great summary, Mav. So we have a series of podcasts coming up on building your business or your freelancing career or just your side hustle. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Mav? Yeah, for sure. So we're looking to put together a a six-part series, so something a little bit more uplifting compared to this topic, for sure. (laughs) Hopefully. This is really heavy stuff. (laughs) This is pretty heavy, right? And But we wanted to put together something that was, you know, something a little different. We've never tried this before, and we said, hey, you know, let's put together a six-part series here. Uh, So it's definitely going to be long. You know, it looks like a lot of our shows go about an hour, a little bit over. Uh, so we're going to be definitely putting together some really good content um, over the next six uh, six episodes, really going from uh, motivation all the way down to you know branding and self-publishing. So uh, definitely some really good stuff coming down. So stay tuned for that. Absolutely. And we've talked about some of the other aspects of business before. Those are totally, you know, podcast episodes worth referring to as we go through this as well. But the next six will be on, you know, fresh topics that we have yet to cover. So it's exciting for us. And um, I think you'll enjoy it as well. So we really do want to interact with you. We hope you'll leave a comment on our podcast. You can do that on YouTube, where we post all of our podcast episodes are also on our website at usingyourpower.com. You can just go into the show notes and leave a comment on any episode. Another great way to interact with us is with Facebook Messenger. You can just click the blue icon in our website, leave a comment. We'll get it pretty much almost instantaneously. And we know that you would love to hear from us instantaneously too. And to the extent that we're able, we will rely, reply to you as soon as we can. While you're on the website and looking for the comment section at the bottom, scroll just a little bit above it and go and grab our free audio for you. 10 simple ways to unleash your personal power that'll help you get going with some of the things that we talk about on this show really simple concepts that you can put into action right away so thanks so much for joining us this has been using your power have a wonderful day